All right, break hard podcast time. Back again for, well, I don't know, maybe the second iteration of this. I think I'll probably try to continue to do this weekly, and it felt like this week after Richmond was maybe the best time to fire this back up and give it another go. Not going to be an hour long. I don't want to talk for an hour, and I don't think you want to listen to me for an hour. But we will recap what happens throughout the racing weekend, and maybe you'll have a guest on here and there. We'll see how all of this goes. But for now, you have just me talking about what happened this weekend at Richmond. And it's a good thing that Denny Hamlin's sponsored by Jumpman, because that's exactly what he did on that final restart. He jumped, and he jumped on Martin Truex Jr. before the restart line and went on to win the race. And what has become one of the more controversial moments on NASCAR social in quite some time. So the question is, like, what is the repercussion for this? Well, nothing. NASCAR Senior Vice President Elton Sawyer came out last night after the race and kind of, in my opinion, flippantly was like, oh yeah, we reviewed it, it's fine. But then you see the in-car camera from Martin Trex Jr. and you can clearly hear and see the 11 car take off before that restart line. And now, I know, it's a bit of a judgment call, but what's the point of the line if you're not going to utilize it? I saw Josh Wise, the driver development coach over in the Chevy camp, basically say like he's he studies all these restarts because, of course, his job is to help the Chevy drivers get better. And he said, basically, everybody knows in the Cup Series, especially in overtime, that when you get down to an overtime restart, you can kind of just go when you want. Maybe trigger it a little bit earlier because it helps you snooker, you know, the guy on the outside, the second place car. And while I don't disagree with that move, take, whatever you want to call it. There's rules for a reason, and I know when it comes down to this, there's going to be a lot of fans that are like, NASCAR never calls the rules consistently, and there's definitely times where NASCAR has been consistently inconsistent, and restarts are probably one of those gray areas, maybe, but at the end of the day, it all comes down to a judgment call. I just didn't like the response that we got from NASCAR after the moment, and sure, they could come out on Tuesday when Elton Sawyer typically goes on SiriusXM NASCAR and say, hey, listen, hand up, we messed up. But if they have a better explanation, again, I'm all ears for it. Because at the end of the day, he clearly jumped. And that's kind of my biggest point here. It's like, well, what's the point of the restart zone? What's the point of the rules if you're not going to actually enforce the rules? So last week at Circuit of the Americas, NASCAR called track violations all day on Saturday, a few on Sunday in the cup race, and famously, at this point, called Chase Elliott for getting loose, cutting the corner, trying to save the car, and NASCAR's like, well, he cut the corner. So there's no gray area there. There's a zero tolerance policy essentially at Coda. But then when you get here, there appears to be a gray area before the restart zone. And that just doesn't really make any sense to me because Denny could have waited another 10 feet, 15 feet and hammered it as soon as he got to the restart line. Could have done that, which is obviously legal. Could have waited all the way to the end of that box to go if he wanted to. And instead he launches early and that seemingly is okay. Martin Truex Jr., of course, was infuriated after the race, and he ran into the 11 car to sh- you know, show his displeasure. He tried to wreck the 5 car in the back stretch on the last lap. Larson puts him into the wall down the front stretch, like, what are you doing, dude? And then gets out and kind of laughs about it, and he's like, I hope he's not mad at me, even though Truex is the one that started this. Everything about the end of the race made up for the lackluster specifically third stage of this race you had with two laps to go bubble Wallace getting loose gets into the five car who was also kind of skating at the same time they make slight contact they go spinning well the five car goes spinning Bubba then pits thinking that maybe he'll get to restart third here and like have a really good shot at winning this thing and instead or fourth I guess probably where he would have racked up at and instead has a loose wheel they have to fix the tire get him back out he ends up finishing 13th Larson is able to rebound for a third place finish which obviously should have been bad Bubba walks up to him after the race and he's like I'm so sorry I didn't mean to get into you he's like I know whatever I have coming my way is warranted and Larson didn't really seem that upset about it because he's like it worked out well for me and Bubba's like yeah it netted you out perfectly he's like karma's a bitch for me because he ended up you know getting that loose wheel and having to stop and have that fixed before he left the pit box of course you have your nascar conspiracy theorists out here that are like bubba intentionally wrecked kyle larson so that his team owner denny hamlin could win the race again what are we talking about here you think that all of these factors are going to line up perfectly this uh, the r conspiracy the conspiracy subreddit comes up with some crazy conspiracies if you ever want a good time go look at that because you'll be like i am a sane individual then you'll feel better about yourself honestly some of the people that come up with these nascar conspiracies 100 percent delve around that cesspool of our conspiracy 
There's no way that Bubba spun out Kyle Larson thinking that Denny Hamlin was going to win this race. Do you know how many variables go into winning a race? Bubba causing it was just one variable that went into Denny winning. Obviously, him jumping the restart is another. His pit crew getting him off the pit road first, another one. So that is so stupid. And then, of course, you have more of the tinfoil hat crowd out here, specifically the Facebook group, that will be like, of course, NASCAR, I'm not going to do my stereotypical Southern voice because it's not fair because there's people outside of the South that definitely don't, uh, that have the same thoughts and don't sound like that. So I'm not going to stereotype it. But there are people that are like, NASCAR wanted a Toyota to win. That's why they threw the caution. That's why this restart set up the way it was. Completely ignoring the fact that Martin Truex Jr. was going to sail to victory as a Toyota in the Toyota Owners 400. And that's, they're like, oh yeah, you sponsor the race, you get the win. What? That's probably why Jimmy Johnson won all those races at Lowe's Motor Speedway and why uh, Joey Logano wins the Pennzoil 400 out in Las Vegas a lot. Probably why he won the AAA uh, uh, race at Auto Club. <sighs> yeah, you're right. Everything's set up. It's all rigged. It's rigged, y'all. Put on the tinfoil hat. I don't have a tinfoil hat around here. I just have a bunch of Lockdown brand hats. And if you do like a good hat, Lockdown brand has great hats. Very breathable. I have a lot of hair. Granted, it's trimmed right now. But in summertime... These are going to come out clutch. And you can use code BREAKHARD10 at checkout to save some money. Moving on to the rest of this podcast real quick. Well, the rest of the race, rather. So the race started about 15 minutes late because of rain. NASCAR deemed it a wet weather start, so they put on the wet weather tires. And specifically, do not mention that they're rain tires because they aren't. They cannot race in the rain while it's actively actively raining. Instead, they can only race when it's damp. So that got them on track about 45 minutes before, you know, they probably could have if they sat around and tried to dry the rest of the track. Those first 30 laps were phenomenal. That was the best racing at Richmond we've seen since it had a sealer on it. Probably the best racing at Richmond we've seen since at least 2012, 2014. So the better part of a decade plus. And of course, at lap 30, NASCAR decides to throw a comp caution. And this is where I have another issue with what we saw on. I don't want to sound like I'm complaining. Because I do think that the people NASCAR has in place right now are actually good at what they do. However, some of the inconsistencies and some of the procedures maybe can be better explained to the general audience. And maybe I can talk to somebody over there. But there's a couple of things where I'm like, why would you do it this way? So they throw the comp caution at lap 30. And they do this because they want to switch the cars over to slicks, to the dry weather tires, obviously. And they don't want to leave that up to the teams. They said eventually they want to do that, which I don't know at this point. This has been going on for two years now. Well, at what point do we just accept that they're big boys and they know how to make decisions on their own? So NASCAR brings all the cars down for non-competitive pit stops at lap 30. We didn't go back racing until lap 48. They did 18 laps under caution because they wanted to dry pit road and dry some other parts of the track. And it's like, well, wouldn't have been easier to just red flag the race, dry pit road and not waste these 18 laps under caution. Like that's a pretty decent run, especially when stage one was only 70 laps. So then they go back to racing and it's on the dry tire, the slick tire, and the racing's just not very good. It was okay. It was fine. It was better than what we saw on stage three, but it wasn't as good as the wet weather tire. Why? Because there's less grip. They're running about a second faster with the wet weather tire, essentially. Or the dry weather tire. My bad. Apologies there. So then they go back to racing, and there's a caution with about six laps to go in stage one. And typically, typically, that was the caution where Daniel Suarez turned down into Josh Berry. They had some words after the race. Josh did not seem very um, threatened by the 99. He was just leaning on his car like, yeah, dude, I don't know, man. I've been on short tracks across the country. You, tur- you turned out. I don't know. So the 99 spun. Didn't really get any damage out of it. Maybe just kind of doomed his night from there. But the caution comes out with six laps to go. Typically, NASCAR would have hustled to make sure there was a one lap shootout for the end of the stage. One of my biggest complaints is like if there's a caution within like the final five to six laps of a stage, just go ahead and end the stage. Don't do a one lap shootout to then go back under caution for another 10 minutes of downtime. You talk about wanting to capture the casual fan all the time. It's so hard to capture the casual fan when they tune in under caution, see one lap of racing, and then you go back under caution for another 10 minutes. It's like, well, why would we stick around to watch this? Is this what people do? Just watch cars go around in a parade? It's it's pointless. So they don't do a one lap shootout. I'm like, okay, that's fine. And instead they proceed to do upwards of another 15 laps worth of, of track drying. 
And at first, they were like, when the caution came out, they said there will not be competitive pit stops. They'll be non-competitive again because pit road is still too slick. Although, if it's raining on a road course, we can do live pit stops, competitive pit stops. That's fine. On an oval, apparently, it's just a disaster. You can't do it. Again, if there's a better explanation for it, I'm all ears, honestly. Like, I would love to know what the difference there is. But, so they go under caution for literally 15 laps. So they have the five, five basically, for the stage end, and then another 10 laps. They said they go back to racing at lap 80. Yeah, so 10 laps after the end of the stage at lap 70. We, we've now just wasted 32 laps under caution for seemingly track drying efforts. And it's like, well, you could have red flagged this at the comp caution at lap 30 and saved everybody some time and given people, you know, racing. Fans are already happy. Let me say this. Fans were already happy that they got the wet weather racing in that first 30 laps because it started about 45 minutes earlier, like I said, than it should have. You've already whetted their appetite. So then just red flag it for 10 minutes, dry pit road off real quick, and then get back to racing. That way you don't have to have this indecisiveness of being like non-competitive. Oh, no, no, just kidding. Competitive pit stops. It's like, wait a second. What happened here? We were just planning on not doing any of this. So then you have stage two. And honestly, I loved what stage two brought to us. It had the strategy that Richmond has become in the last few years. In stage two, you had with the one-stop strategy, Martin Shrix Jr., basically everybody else in the field, would that strategy prevail over the two-stop strategy? No. Let me rephrase that. Would the two-stop strategy of Martin Shrix Jr., basically everybody else in the field, prevail over the one-stop strategy of Kyle Larson, Alex Bowman, and I believe Bubba Wallace was on this as well. And it was all about the play out. We were going to find out. It was going to be very compelling. It was one of the few times where you're like, Richmond's going to deliver a compelling storyline here, especially in stage two in a time where like it's been pretty mundane, uh, most of these Richmond races throughout the middle part of the, of the race. And then Kyle Busch goes up and taps the wall and NASCAR hammers that caution light as soon as they see him get out of control. And again, Elton Sawyer explained this after the race. I understand the thought process. And he's like, we saw a car get out of control. We saw it touch the wall. We thought maybe he had blown a brake rotor. We saw him going slow. Okay. That's a just answer. That's a sufficient answer. I can agree with the thought process behind that. Maybe, just maybe though, you let it play out a little bit more because essentially this whole stage, especially the middle part of this two thirds, let me just say this, two thirds of the stage was a green flag pit cycle. And I know that's going to be hard for some people to wrap their brains around because typically a pit cycle lasts like maybe five, six laps. This pit cycle was essentially going to last the better part of like 60 laps. And that's fine. Everything was going to play out and it was going to be interesting at the end to see which strategy was going to prevail. And instead, when they hammer that caution because Kyle Busch somewhat touched the wall, that ruined everything. And Larson comes over the radio and he's like, that screws us, doesn't it? And they're like, yeah, it does. And it did. It trapped Alex Bowman a lap down, and it ruined his night. He was a top five car. He ends up finishing, I believe, like 17th, uh, which is not indicative of his speed or where he was He was running at. Yeah, he finished 17th, which is unfortunate. Uh, back on the lead lap, but not where he needed to be. So to say all of that, NASCAR has said that they don't like to throw cautions during a green flag pit cycle. We saw it at Atlanta. Michael McDowell and Al, or William Byron literally spun and hit the wall on pit entrance at Atlanta, 24 car was sitting almost on the racetrack, almost on the racing line, right below that white line on the apron. No caution there. Didn't want to throw it. Okay, to me, that was way more dangerous than Kyle Busch going slow on a short track because at the same time, people were like, oh, they can they can miss him. Like, that's not a big deal. I just don't understand why you had to throw a caution there. I understand. Don't get me wrong. I just said why I understand, but I also don't understand. Maybe you just wait a little bit longer. At least he made contact, and it wasn't like that Haley Deegan caution at Phoenix where she just got loose, and they threw the caution, and she never touched the wall. That was a bad caution. And on Saturday, in the extended race, Haley Deegan's going very slowly around the racetrack because she had lost power in the closing laps, and they didn't throw a caution for that because she was able to make it back to pit road. Well, Kyle Busch was also able to make it back to pit road. And again, I understand they were concerned about debris being on track, but you can wait half a second maybe and have your spotter be like, hey, there's debris out here. So that part was frustrating because stage two was actually setting up to be pretty compelling. And I would argue that stage one and stage two before that caution, this was actually a pretty good race. I had 
probably set my expectations around like the the 60s and before that caution came out i was like this is probably like around an 80 right now like by by richmond next gen gen 7 car standards this race was pretty good and then stage three happened and boy did anything that i had positive to say about what was going on in the first two stages of this race just go right off the window i was not pleased uh with what i saw at all At one point, Cliff Daniels told Kyle Larson, he's like, yeah, don't worry about passing. Nobody in the top 15 has passed each other. And he's right. There was no passing happening at all. I believe there were technically three on-track passes for, well, no. Yeah, three on-track passes for the lead on Sunday night. You had your first one at the beginning of the race when Chase Elliott went around the outside of Kyle Larson on lap one. So I guess it is technically a lead change to lead that lap. He goes on, leads five laps. Kyle Larson passes him back. Okay, great. There's another uh, green flag pass. And then at the end, well, towards the end of the race, you had Martin Truex Jr. and Kyle Larson racing up pit road. Truex ends up passing him down the front stretch a lap later. Technically an on-track pass for the lead. Actually, I don't think it was for the lead at that moment. For the eventual lead. Regardless, they were switching back and forth. Yeah, it was not for the lead at that moment. The passing was at a premium, and it's really unfortunate because (sighs) Richmond used to be, like, it literally had the nickname The Action Track. And I'll be honest with you, there hasn't been action at Richmond longer than probably Betty White has had action. It has not been a good race in a long, long time. RIP Betty White. Kind of forgot that she was, (sighs) whoops, whatever. We're moving on. So you can see it's really frustrating because stage three just wasn't great. You had one strategy, essentially. Denny Hamlin got off strategy by about 10 laps, which helped him out there at the end. But for the most part, it was all straightforward. And I don't know. It didn't really do much for me. I wasn't that impressed by what we saw at the end. And then, of course, like I talked about at the beginning of this podcast, that's when the caution comes out with two laps to go. Bubba Wallace gets into Kyle Larson setting up this restart to which you know Denny Hamlin then jumped the restart so yeah for me this race probably gets around like a 64 63 I it just to me it left a bad taste in my mouth was it the worst Richmond race I've ever seen absolutely not I've seen worse Richmond races for sure bar none but at the same time as good as stage one was as good as stage two is going to play out from a strategy standpoint stage three was just ugh. and then the controversy at the end i think my biggest complaint is like the fastest car didn't win and i hate when the fastest car doesn't win the race because of a late race caution or something like this i argue this is a hot take i hate nascar overtime i don't need an overtime finish i'm very much in the camp of just respect the race distance Race ends at 400 laps. Checkered falls at 400 laps. We don't need to go lap 407. We don't need it. What's the point of it? All it does is create controversy and make sure that, well, not make sure, but sometimes ensures that the best card doesn't win. And it's like, is that fair? Is that really fair how this goes down? Imagine just in an NBA game or an NFL game, you're up by three touchdowns. And then at the last moment, the NFL is like, oh no, just kidding. It's a tie game now and it will be sudden death. And whoever scores a touchdown wins. It's like, wait. Uh, why did I work so hard? It's stupid. And granted, caution can fall at any time, so I understand the thought process behind that and people being like, well, you're dumb. Fair. It just bums me out because it's like, Denny's also not a popular winner. If you look at the Jeff Gluck, was it a good race poll? I believe when I looked this morning, it was kind of split down the middle, 50-50. And I was kind of, I was actually really surprised by that because I didn't think people would like it. 51% of people say it was a good race kind of surprised by that i figured it would be below 50 because it wasn't a it was a good race until it wasn't a good race for me so i'm not in love with what we saw i understand most of it like i said i don't mean to sound like i'm complaining it's just more of like give me consistency if there's a rule and if there's a line in place why aren't we calling it like that and i know it's a judgment call did he fire off early there's enough data on these cars now s t data data, whatever you want to call it, TJ Majors, for them to figure this out. And it's frustrating that they that they haven't done that. So uh, 
Moving on to Martinsville. We'll see there. Toyotas, though. Toyotas look strong on these short flat tracks. They obviously dominated at... Um, where were they at? Phoenix. Dominated Phoenix. Martin Trex Jr. leads 288 laps. No, sorry. 228 laps Sunday night. Denny Hamlin leads 17. Christopher Bell leads 9. And Bubba Wallace led 2. So, as a manufacturer, they absolutely dominated the, dominated the night. Uh, Kyle Larson led 144. So, you had two drivers leading uh, over 100 laps. Three drivers in double digits. Denny being the other at 17. Uh, going through the rundown of this list real quick, Josh Berry had a really good night. Qualified 30th, was running third on speed, got messed up on strategy. Kind of not killed his night, but hurt it for sure. He comes home 11th. Chase Elliott gets a top five finish. I do believe that is Chase Elliott's first top five finish. Um, I'm going to say... I know he had he had to have a top five after the Indianapolis Road Course, right? We all get to discover this in real time. Come along for the ride, friends. Yes, he had a top five finish at the Daytona Cutoff Race in the summer. So it had been, what is that, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 races since he had a top five finish. So he finally gets a top five. They had good speed. I saw the Chase Elliott crowd on Reddit this weekend was losing their minds, being completely rational people like they typically are, kind of like a Taylor Swift fan where they were like, you know, Hendrick Motorsports turned their back on Chase Elliott. It's time for him to leave. Okay. I think we all missed the memo on that one. Chris Rebell rebounded from a speeding penalty to finish uh, P6. William Byron, quiet night for him. Kind of just rode around seventh. Chris Buescher came home. Uh, and, well, Brad Keselowski, eighth. Chris Buescher, ninth. So good, good run for RFK once again. Tyler Reddick, I think he just ran 10th place the entire race. I don't think he ever moved from there. Uh, let me look at the loop data real quick. Where is Tyler Reddick? His average run position was 13th. So, yeah, he was just kind of hung out around 10th the entire night. Uh, Eric Jones, P14, good run for him. Noah Gragson, P12. Once again, Noah's been impressive. The two new guys to SHR, that being Josh Berry and Noah Graxon, have absolutely been the most impressive parts of that team this year. Uh, Alex Bowman, like I said, P17, had a way better night than that. Unfortunate that he got caught a lap down there. Corey LaJoy had absolutely... No, I He probably could have just parked and gone home, and that would have been a better night for him. Finishes dead last, three laps down, was, more than, was four laps down at one point. Just... A bad night for him. Zane Smith finished uh, the same as him, 35th. So those Spire cars were not good at all. They were terrible. Harrison Burton got engaged, did not help him get any quicker. He finished 34th, two laps down. They got to do something there. So that was the NASCAR Cup Series race. The Xfinity race on Saturday. Wrap this up maybe like the next six minutes here. Definitely going to wrap it up in the next six minutes. Was won by... Chandler Smith, because God intended for him to do that or something like that. I don't know. Uh, Chandler Smith. I I think Chandler Smith's weird. I know a lot of it comes down to me just not understand. Not uh, Southern culture is wild to me. Getting married at like 18, kids by 21. I am in my 30s and have not neither of those things. And I'm very content <laughs> with that. But hey, if he's happy, more power to him. I could just do without all the preaching at the end of this. Um, but it's a good thing he's at Gibbs. Joe Gibbs Racing, though, does have a 1-2-3 finish. Chandler Smith picks up his second win of the season, third win of his career, second win at Richmond, which the broadcast, the broadcast, which is over the top with the Chandler Smith love this weekend. I was like, is Brett Griffin running the Fox broadcast right now? Because nobody talks as highly about Chandler other than, than Brett, who thinks that he's a current Cup Series champion or something. I, it's very bizarre. Eric Almarola led the most laps of the day with 95. He comes home second. Uh, apparently he, he gets us, doesn't get him to victory lane though, especially on this weekend of all weekends. You think that would be the time that he would get you to victory lane, but I guess not. Taylor Gray comes home third in his first, I believe that's his first Xfinity series start. Um, yeah, great run for him. Bit of a Noah Gragson esque type of run in his Xfinity debut there, which is, I don't know if it's good or bad, <laughs> but Noah did have a really good run at Richmond in his debut with uh, Joe Gibbs Racing as well. Corey Heim finishes fourth, so it's a one, two, three, four for Toyota. Uh, Corey Heim is the real deal. 
if you're not buying stock in him, you absolutely should. Should be a truck champion if it wasn't for Carson Hosevar uh, doing Carson Hosevar things. Jesse Love, once again, finishes fifth. He has become a bright spot over there at RCR. Definitely going to win a race this year. And the biggest story of the day, I had to just work down the list to get to this, is Bubba Pollard finishing P6 on debut for JRM. Never been in a Xfinity car before. Never been in a truck. Been in an ARCA car before. Just comes in. Lays down the fastest time in practice. Sick. He's going to do really well. Goes out, qualifies second to last. All right. Not exactly. We would have preferred to be somewhere in the middle there. But then on pure speed and having a great team behind him, manages to finish P6. And that is a huge win for uh, a legend of the grassroots short track scene. I mean, I've talked about this before. Bubba Pollard has won basically everything under the sun, not the Snowball Derby. And that's not for a lack of trying. The guy wins and everything he gets in. He's 37 years old, three kids, a wife. He's just a working, he's a working class hero. And he's a guy that needs to be in NASCAR. He has the speed. Does he want to be here full time? He's spoken before that he doesn't necessarily want to do this full time. The schedule, everything like that. I get it. I think after he gets his first taste here, he would love to do it again. And I mean, even post race on his cool down lap, he, he thanked the team and he said, I'd love to do this again. Um, yeah, I hope that this isn't the one and only time we see Bubba Pollard in an Xfinity car. I think it's too late in in life to maybe make that. If he he's not, he's too late to make it to the Cup Series full time, more than likely. But this is a guy that could easily hop into an Xfinity car, barring a you know bringing a budget for you know the next five to ten years maybe, and be competitive. And I think that would be really exciting. Does again, does he want to do that? I'm not sure. Uh, but I was massively impressed and i'm so glad that he finished p6 because so many times we hear about how great these guys are on short tracks they show up and maybe don't have the run that everybody expected them to i'm glad that he was able to back it up i'm glad that junior put him in this car this car will run again next weekend at martinsville carson quapple behind the wheel the cars tour defending two-time cars tour champion current cars tour points leader as well so it'll be interesting to see how he does there but i'm just glad that bubba pollard had a really really good run um there at the end of the race hopefully we get to see more of him obviously has a lot to do with budget and everything like that and i would be remiss if i did not <laughs> shout out matt de benedetto because i talk about him enough on this podcast and i clearly not the biggest matt de benedetto fan but i did say it makes when they announced that he was doing this deal with viking motorsport through sieg i said it makes a lot of sense because cj mclaughlin isn't the guy like he's just not but matt de benedetto is good enough to give you a baseline on where you're at and that's exactly what he was able to do for these guys. He gave them a baseline, qualified the car 31st, finished 18th. Slow and steady, ran a clean race, hats off to him. That's exactly kind of where I expect Matt D to be. And he was the best finishing of the Sieg entered cars on Sunday. So, like I said, good run for him overall. Xfinity is off to, the, to Martinsville. All three series will be in action at Martinsville this upcoming weekend. Uh, trucks on Friday night. You have Cam Waters, Australian supercar driver, making his NASCAR debut in the Truck Series on Friday night with Thor, uh, Thor Sport Racing. Xfinity on Saturday, Cup on Sunday, 400 lapper for the Cup race. Remember, it went from 500 to 400. And we also have the Formula One Japanese Grand Prix this weekend as well. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram, and Twitter at Break Hard Blog.